Hi everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you people can uh, listen to me and I am visible also to all of you. And seriously what I am hoping is that this session goes uninterrupted. My internet connection works well. Last time we had to interrupt this session. I even couldn't go beyond question one with all of you. Okay. So how are all of you doing? So I can see you are putting a thumbs up. That means I am visible and audible to all of you. Great. Chalo. Then I'm not going to waste much time and uh, let's go quickly to question number one, which we started that day also. I started discussing with you this question and I'm reading it out again. So a 20 year old G1 at 38 weeks of gestation presents with regular painful uterine contractions every three to four minutes lasting for 60 seconds, right? So she's having contractions every three to four minutes, which are lasting for 60 seconds. On pelvic examination, she's three centimeters dilated, 90% effaced and on amniotomy was performed and clear fluid was noted, right? Now the patient received epidural analgesia for pain management. Fetal heart rate tracing is reactive. One hour later, her cervix is five centimeters dilated and 100% effaced. Fetal heart rate tracing is shown. Which of the following is the next best step? So this patient comes to us in labor. She's three centimeters dilated and amniotomy is performed. And after one hour, she's five centimeters dilated. Initially, her fetal heart rate or her CTG was reactive CTG. And now this is the picture which you are getting, right? Now they are saying that what is the further line of management? You So there are two things which are involved in this question. One is your knowledge on labor, that how a normal labor progresses and if labor is getting prolonged, if first stage is getting prolonged, what management you have to do. If second stage is, get, I mean, if active phase is getting protracted, what management you are going to do. One is that knowledge. The other thing is your knowledge on CTG, how you interpret a CTG and how do you apply that interpretation. So these are the two things which you have, which are being tested. The knowledge of these two things is being tested by this question, right? So first, let us correlate the labor findings and see as per the progression of labor is any step needed to be done. And then we are going to talk about the CTG findings, right? Now, a uh, very important thing is the guidelines. So please remember that in first stage of labor, according to ACOG, the latent phase is from the time when a patient feels true labor pains and up till 5 centimeters dilatation. From 6 centimeters to fully dilated cervix, that is 10 centimeters, is the active phase. Right? Now, whenever we are talking about partogram or WHO guidelines, then Latent phase was ending at 3 centimeters and active phase was beginning at 4 centimeters. So in a partogram, the active phase begins at 4 centimeters and markings are going to begin as per the uh, active phase that is as per 4 centimeters. Now recently, WHO has changed its guidelines, right? So there are new guidelines, but partogram is still based on the older guidelines. Right now, as per the new guidelines of WHO, active phase is beginning at five centimeters. So you have to keep three things in mind. Number one, as per ACOG, active phase begins at six centimeters. As per partogram or the WHO's previous guidelines, the active phase was beginning at 4 centimeters. But as per the latest WHO guidelines, now please, but you don't get confused while you are solving questions related to labor. Unless and until they are talking to you about latest guidelines, unless and until they mention this word that as per the latest WHO guidelines, active phase begins at Till that time, you are not going to say 5 centimeters. Partogram is still based on the previous guidelines. And in partogram, active phase is beginning at 
four centimeters. Have I made my point clear to all of you? Have you understood six centimeters, four centimeters, and five centimeters? These are all the you know uh, different guidelines saying different things that when is active phase beginning, right? So this is ACOG guidelines, then as per Partogram and as per WHO's latest guidelines. This point is clear to all of you. If you are a Maro subscriber, this is something which I have told you in the Delta videos. Uh, rest of you, please put a thumbs up if you've understood this point. Quickly, I want to see a thumbs up in the chat box if you've understood when active phase begins as per different guidelines. I'm just waiting for two minutes so that I can see your thumbs ups. Okay, Harith, you've understood. Good. Good. So all of you are understanding. Great. Now comes latent phase when it is said to be prolonged. Latent phase, the normal duration of latent phase in a primary gravida female, P over here is a primary gravida, is 12 hours and in a multigravida, M is for multigravida, it is 8 hours. And latent phase is said to be prolonged if it is more than equal to 20 hours in primary gravida, more than equal to 14 hours in a multigravida. And suppose in a question you are getting prolonged latent phase and they ask you what is the management. Now please remember all these managements which I am telling you, they apply till the time fetal heart rate is reactive. Right. So if there is no fetal distress and you are getting prolonged latent phase, then the management is rest. Right. Now comes the di uh, active phase. In active phase, we have some, you know, you have to keep in mind what dilatation is happening. Now, if dilatation, normal dilatation in a primary gravida female in active phase is 1.2 centimeters per hour. And in multigravida, it is 1.5 centimeters per hour. Now, WHO says that if it is less than 1 centimeter per hour, right? That is what WHO says. That, you know, the uh, minimum dilatation, which according to WHO should happen, forget about primary gravida, forget about multigravida, it is 1 centimeters per hour, right? So, if it is less than 1 centimeter per hour, then you call it as protracted active phase, right? And the management of protracted active phases are ARM, that is amniotomy. And after half an hour, you should start oxytocin. Clear to all of you? So that is the management of a protracted active phase. But please remember, these managements we are going to do only if, you know, fetal heart rate is reactive. And just now I'll tell you a little bit more details about the management of protracted active phase. Please remember that active phase, the dilatation can happen slowly, right? In two cases, if there is a cephalopelvic disproportion or if there is occipital posterior position. So before you do an ARM and before you say that this is a protracted active phase, I'm going to manage it by ARM or by oxytocin, you should rule out cephalopelvic disproportion and you should rule out the um, occipital posterior position and then you should do ARM and then you uh, after half an hour you should start with uh, oxytocin right uh, yes Himavati normally we go with ACOG guidelines in clinical practice we are going with ACOG guidelines which say that active phase begins at six centimeters dilatation that is normally what we do right okay now, in your question, they are saying that a patient comes at 3 centimeters dilatation and ARM was done. And after ARM, when after one hour, you know, they, when after one hour, uh, the dilatation was seen, it was 5 centimeters. So, even if I say that patient is in active phase, although as per the new clinical guidelines, as per ACOG, patient is not in clinical, uh, is not in active phase. But still, if I believe that this patient, according to partogram, if I say that this patient is an active phase, because according to partogram, 
active phase begins at 4 cm dilatation. So then also in one hour I am seeing that patient is dilating by 2 cm. From 3 cm she is becoming 5 cm. So that means her progress is very good. I am not going to say that this is a protracted active phase. Right, my diagnosis is not protracted active phase. My pro my diagnosis is this is normal progress of labor. And a normal progress of labor, if fetal heart rate is normal, I don't have to do anything. Now comes, is fetal heart rate normal in this? So look at this CTG finding over here. What are you getting in this graph? Can you see a wave-like pattern? Now, one very important thing which you have to remember is, in CTG, you are going to get two graphs. Number one, the graph which is given above, that is the fetal heart rate graph. And the graph which is coming at the bottom, that is your uterine contractions. Right? And since I am seeing two graphs, that means I am dealing with CTG. Right? If the same thing I would have got without uterine contractions then I would have called it as an NST. So NST and CTG basically are the same thing. CTG is the term which you give when you are monitoring fetal heart rate during labor and NST is when you are doing the same thing when the patient is not in labor but in antepartum period. Right. So this is one confusions which you always have and that is what is NST and what is CTG. So over here this is a CTG graph because over here I can see uterine contractions. Right. Now this over here the pattern which you are getting is a wave like pattern which is called as sinusoidal pattern. And sinusoidal pattern it is seen in case of fetal anemias. So whenever there is fetal anemia, which could be due to RH incompatibility, which could be due to twin to twin transfusion syndrome, which could be due to Vasa Previa, you get this kind of pattern. And this pattern is a category 3 CTG pattern. So in your exams, there are two categories of CTG patterns which you should be knowing. Category 1 and category 3. Category 1 means normal CTG. Right, And in a normal CTG, you are going to get fetal heart rate between 110 to 160 beats per minute. Beat to beat variability will be present and that will be between 5 to 25 beats per minute. What do you understand by beat to beat variability? That means fetal heart rate will never be fixed. There will be a variation of 5 to 25 beats per minute. Then in a normal CTG, you will never get late deceleration. You will never get variable decelerations. Early decelerations may be present or may not be present. And acceleration may be present or may not be present. This is category 1 CTG finding. Right? Now, uh, this is in contrast to NST. NST is done in antenatal period and NST may very significant hota hai acceleration. You know, acceleration is the only thing which we are looking in NST. That means with fetal movement, fetal heart rate should increase by 15 beats per minute. Right? So, NST may acceleration ki importance hoti hai. In a CTG, that means when a patient is in labor, at that time, accelerations are not important. If you are getting accelerations, well and good on CTG. If you are not getting accelerations, then also it's fine. But in a CTG, the more important thing is you have to look out for decelerations. If you are getting late decelerations, that is a problem. Right? If you are getting variable deceleration, that is a problem. But if you are getting early decelerations, then that's not a problem. So a normal CTG may, you are going to get fetal heart rate between 110 to 160 beats per minute. Beat to beat variability should be seen. There shouldn't be any late deceleration. There shouldn't be any variable decelerations. Early deceleration may be there, may not be there. Or accelerations may be there, may not be there. Right now, if you are getting these things, I will say that CTG is normal. But if I am getting absent variability, if fetal heart rate variability, beat to beat variability is absent with any of these following things, with either bradycardia 
or persistent late decelerations or persistent variable decelerations or if i am getting sinusoidal heart rate pattern these are the things which mean there is category 3 ctg finding and category 3 ctg finding ka matlab hai ki you have to go for immediate delivery and simultaneously in utero resuscitation so these are the findings if you are getting they are not normal and you have to immediately deliver the mother right simultaneously you have to go for in utero resuscitation now you'll ask me what is in utero resuscitation that means you are going to turn the patient in left lateral position you are going to give oxygen by mask and if any uh, oxytocin drip was being given you have to stop it so that now there are no more further uterine contractions right so this is what is in in utero resuscitation have you understood so finding of any of these means immediate delivery and this is what you are getting in this patient you are getting sinusoidal heart rate pattern and because you are getting sinusoidal heart rate pattern you have to immediately perform cesarean section now let's rule out other options are you going to tell this female to begin pushing no you are never going to tell her to begin pushing at 5 cm dilatation pushing should be done only when the cervix is fully dilated are you going to initiate oxytocin there is no need to initiate oxytocin patient's labor was progressing normally right are you going to stop epidural there is no need to stop epidural right no intervention needed and perform cesarean section no intervention needed would have been if there was no fetal distress right then i would have chosen this answer but i am choosing perform cesarean section because i am getting sinusoidal heart rate pattern because of this finding i am choosing perform cesarean section as the answer I agree to you that CTG is normally not done in all females who are undergoing labor. But if in question they have given us that CTG is being done, then we have to correlate CTG with CTG. Right? You cannot say that why CTG was done. Right? So suppose CTG was done and this was the finding. That is what they want to test. Uh, now, if you are asking me DNA, why amniotomy was done in latent phase again? there is no answer to that normally as per guidelines we do not do amniotomy in latent phase right but in clinical practice suppose if amniotomy was done right i am not saying that this what was done in this question is right no it was not right but then everything what you do in clinical practice is not always as per guidelines right okay coming to question number 2 and again this is has some thing related to labor and ctg so that you get a hack of all questions like these a 30 year old g2p0 at 39 weeks is admitted in active labor with spontaneous rupture of membranes occurring 2 hours prior to admission patient noted clear fluid at that time on examination her cervix is 4 cm dilated and completely effaced fetal head is at zero station and fetal heart rate is reactive now after 2 hours so she came at 4 cm dilated and now after 2 hours she excuse me she is 5 cm dilated and at plus 1 station early decelerations are noted on fetal sorry are noted on fetal heart rate tracing which of the following is the next best step in her labor management now tell me which of the following is the next best step option a administer terbutaline option b initiate oxytocin option c perform cesarean section for arrest of descent option d perform cesarean for early decelerations what's your answer tell me quickly a b c or d tell me your answers a b c or d sundaram d okay anyone else with any answer abhishek c b d c 
so i am getting all sorts of answers here most of you are saying b okay so let's discuss this now just now i told you that if you are getting early deceleration that is a normal ctg right in ctg you may get early decelerations right and if you are getting early decelerations that is not an indication for cesarean section are you understanding this please understand that early decelerations can be physiological at the time of labor because early decelerations are due to head compression right and head compression can be seen during labor clear to all of you yes now first tell me how do you identify early decelerations now whenever you have to identify early late and variable decelerations on ctgs first thing what you should see is whether the deceleration is happening slowly or whether it is happening suddenly now on this graph you can see that the deceleration is happening gradually right this is a gradual deceleration the dip is gradual right it's not sudden look over here this is a dip which is sudden dip right now if you are getting a sudden dip that is variable deceleration whenever you get a sudden dip that's variable deceleration and whenever you are getting a gradual dip either it could be early or it could be late so if you are getting gradual dip then you have to see what is its relation to uterine contraction if the dip in fetal heart rate is exactly coinciding with uterine contraction which means that the dip is happening at the time when uterine contraction begins and dip is ending along with uterine contraction and also the peak point of uterine contraction is coinciding with the dip the lowest point of the fetal heart rate right so the lowest point of fetal heart rate is coinciding with the peak of uterine contractions if all these things are being fulfilled this is early deceleration so early deceleration is the one which coincides with uterine contraction the dip in fetal heart rate is going to begin so i'm just if we make a graph graph over here if this is dip in fetal heart rate and this over here is uterine contraction right so over here you will see that the dip in fetal heart rate will coincide with the beginning of uterine contraction and the fetal heart rate will come back to normal as the uterine contraction ends and the peak point of uterine contraction is going to coincide with the lowest point in the fetal heart rate right that is what is early decelerations and please remember early decelerations can be normally seen during labor and if you are getting early deceleration that is not an indication for cesarean section on the other hand when you see a late deceleration as the name suggests there will be a delay in the onset of of the fetal heart rate dip uterine contraction will begin fetal heart rate will not dip at that time once the uterine contraction is at its peak then the fetal heart rate starts dipping right so the beginning of the dip in fetal heart rate and the beginning of the uterine contraction do not coincide with each other dip in fetal heart rate will happen later than uterine contraction and the dip is going to end also later than uterine contraction right so look over here uterine contraction started here but fetal heart rate at this point was normal the dip in uterine contraction happened later right so it is not starting with uterine contractions when the uterine contraction is at its peak then the fetal heart rate starts dipping now uterine contraction ended here but fetal heart rate dipping didn't end here fetal heart rate dipping has ended later than the uterine contractions that is late deceleration if you are getting absent beat to beat variability and you are getting persistent late deceleration that is an indication for immediate delivery by cesarean 
section. Similarly, if you are getting sudden dips, which is where now uh, late deceleration, it is seen in utero placental insufficiencies, right? Variable deceleration. Variable deceleration is when you get a sudden dip. So if you are getting absent beat to beat variability, then and you are getting sudden dips, that is variable deceleration. That is also an indication for C-section. Variable deceleration you get in cord compression. And please remember that cord compression can happen in cases of oligohydramnios. So oligohydramnios can be associated with variable decelerations. Clear to all of you? Yes. Now in this question over here, what am I getting? I am getting that patient was 4 centimeters dilated. Her membranes have already ruptured. And after 1 hour, what I am seeing? After, one, after 2 hours, I am seeing that she is only 1 centimeter dilated. Now as per partogram, active phase begins at 4 centimeters. Now this patient, if we go by partogram, by partogram, this patient is in active phase. Right? And uh, now in active phase, what I am seeing is that after two hours, she is just one centimeter dilated. She is only one centimeter dilated after two hours. Whereas you know that in active phase, it should be at least one centimeter dilatation per hour. That means she is a case of protracted active phase. And whenever you have a protracted active phase, you should rule out cephalopelvic disproportion because if cephalopelvic disproportion is present, then management is not oxytocin, then management is cesarean section. You should also rule out occipital posterior position because if it is a case of occipital posterior position, then the answer is wait and watch. Once you've ruled out these two things, you have to go for ARM or amniotomy and after half an hour, you have to start oxytocin. So in this patient, already the membranes are ruptured. So that means now I will have to start oxytocin. Turbutylene is a uterine relaxant. Obviously, I'm not going to give a uterine relaxant when uh, her progress is not adequate, right? I am not going to perform cesarean section for early decelerations. Now, all those who were saying option C. See, over here, patient, when she came to you, she was at zero station and now she is at plus one station. So, I am not going to perform a cesarean section for the arrest of descent. There is no indication for performing cesarean section for a protracted active phase unless and until there is fetal distress. Clear to all of you? Yes. So the answer over here is initiate oxytocin. Have you understood question number two? And have you understood the CTG graphs? I'm just waiting for two minutes so that I get your uh, thumbs up and then I'll proceed to question number three. Thank you, Lakshmi, for showing me the thumbs up. Right. Now, uh, please, one very important thing which I want you to remember is category 3 CTG findings. This is something which you tend to forget. Please make a list of these things, right? Category 3 CTG finding is when you have to do a cesarean section. Yes? Okay. Now, this is one more CTG which I want to discuss with you and this is a very, very important potential question. Right, this is what I am thinking is going to be asked either in your INI set this time or NEET PG this time. Now, look at this CTG. In this CTG, what you are seeing? In this CTG, I am saying, seeing that the patient is having uterine contractions. Till here, uterine contractions were happening regularly. Now, look over here. Can you see she is having excessive uterine contractions? Yes. And do you see the dip in fetal heart rate over here? Now, this kind of dip, if you are getting, what is this called as? This, if you get on CTG. So, all the students of Marrow, this is what I have taken up with you in one of the questions in Delta. Ha, this is tachysystole. Very good. Uh, That's a very funny name. But yes, this is tachysystole. Tell me what is what is this what you are getting over here. Tell me what is this? 
this dip which you are getting over here what is this dip called as come on if you are a plan c marrow subscriber this particular graph and a question i have discussed with you in delta one question related to it very important question i have discussed with you tell me the name of this dip what dip are you seeing over here what are you going to call it as shubham i agree this is hyperstimulation but what is this dip tell me what is this dip you are going to call it as excellent pragya this is a prolonged deceleration prolonged deceleration please remember that if deceleration is happening for more than 2 minutes and less than 10 minutes it is called as a prolonged deceleration right a normally deceleration or acceleration happens for less than 2 minutes if it is happening for 2 to 10 minutes that's a prolonged deceleration and if it happens for more than 10 minutes then that is a change in baseline fetal heart rate right so if anything is prolonging for more than 10 minutes then you don't say that this is a prolonged deceleration or prolonged acceleration then you say that there is a change in baseline fetal heart rate now prolonged decelerations are very common with hyper stimulation so whenever there is excessive uterine contractions which happens due to the uterotonic drugs like mesoprost and oxytocin this is very commonly seen with mesoprost and oxytocin so when you are using mesoprost and oxytocin during labor at that time it leads to tetanic uterine contractions and these tetanic uterine contractions lead to fetal distress in the form of prolonged deceleration right or persistent deceleration that is also right clear have you understood so this is prolonged deceleration and what will be the management here here the management is stop the oxytocin stop the uterotonic drug which you are giving immediately stop that drug right that is the next step in management okay clear to all of you now i want you to interpret this graph interpret this graph for me this is your question number 3 interpret this graph for me quickly option a early deceleration option b late deceleration option c sinusoidal pattern and option d normal nst uh, asif first thing what you are going to do whenever you are going to get a prolonged deceleration is stop the uterotonic drug which you are giving and just in case it is not the deceleration is not responding to it you will start in utero resuscitation and if needed i am also going to give terbutaline not retrodrine i will have to give a uterine relaxant and the preferred uterine relaxant will be terbutaline right okay now tell me uh i am seeing all of you answering many of you are saying it's option d some of you are saying it's option a okay first tell me look at this graph and tell me is it nst or is it ctg is it an nst graph or is it a ctg graph is it an nst graph or is it a ctg graph first tell me this that is why i have taken this graph kyunki mujhe pata tha tum mein se aadhe log to ye kahoge ki ye ctg graph hai kyunki do graphs dikh rahe hain bachcho listen here what are you seeing over here can you see uterine activity zero and what is this fm what is fm fetal movement so this is an nst graph jahan pe uterine contraction nahi dikha raha hai this is fetal movement can you see fm 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 this is fetal movement normally jab hum nst measure kar jab hum nst karte hain in nst we have you know you tell a female that she will have to relax for 20 minutes you are going to tie belt around her abdomen 
and for 20 minutes you have to take the nst graph and then you tell her there is a button on the belt which you tie around her abdomen and you tell her to press the button whenever she's feeling fetal movements so normally on your nst the fetal movements are represented by an arrow whenever you get an arrow that means fetal movement has occurred in this particular case instead of showing an arrow they have shown you like this fetal movement they have written fm and they are showing you a fetal movement right now what you are seeing over here all those who are saying that this is early deceleration pehli baar deceleration ka matlab hota hai dip in fetal heart rate yahan pe kahin dip dikh raha hai yahan pe to fetal heart rate increase kar rahi hai can you see fetal heart rate is increasing right this is an increase in fetal heart rate is this a dip no dip hota hai to aise hota right so how can this be early deceleration neither it is early deceleration neither this is late deceleration sinusoidal heart rate pattern mein kya tha just now i showed you in sinusoidal heart rate pattern you continuously get a wave like picture right so is this sinusoidal heart rate pattern no this is not sinusoidal heart rate pattern this is a normal ct a normal nst what is a normal nst normal nst is that in 20 minutes when the patient is lying down you should get at least two accelerations and what are accelerations acceleration is increase in fetal heart rate by 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds right so in a 20 minute period you should get at least two accelerations nst may i look for accelerations right nst may accelerations dekhte hain ctg may decelerations dekhte hain right now whenever there is fetal movement fetal heart increases by 15 beats per minute and that is what is fetal heart rate acceleration so yahan pe i you can see ki fetal movement ke saath sorry one second so this has got stuck look here so this is fetal movement and with fetal movement fetal heart rate is increasing this is fetal movement with fetal movement fetal heart rate is increasing fetal movement fetal heart rate is increasing so this is a normal nst right that is a reactive nst this is a reactive nst right or a normal nst where in a 20 minute period i am getting two or more than two accelerations so if you get two or more than two accelerations in a 20 minute period that's a reactive nst clear yes any confusions here if you have any confusions just tell me just now let me know now if you have any confusions. These graphs are very, very important, but so you cannot get to, uh, you know, you cannot afford to get them wrong. Where is time mentioned? Time is not mentioned over here. So, Time is not mentioned here. Remember the speed of the graph. The graph paper is 1 centimeter per minute. So the graph paper moves by a speed of 1 centimeter per minute. Right? Until 20 minutes I am going to see the graph. Right? Okay? Clear? Any confusions? No? Okay. And is me to hona hi nahi chahiye tha koi confusion. There is no deceleration being mentioned here. Deceleration hota to dip hota. 
so i don't think so there is any confusion over here this cannot be early deceleration late deceleration or sinusoidal heart rate pattern okay now in this graph i am not telling you about beat to beat variability because it is not shown very clearly in this graph right but i definitely know this that it is accelerations which are happening right i can see the accelerations so in nst accelerations if you are getting two accelerations in 20 minutes two or more than two accelerations in 20 minutes that's a normal nst or a reactive nst okay now coming to question number 4 so those were three questions where i had linked your labor to uh, ctg now coming to question number 4 a 28 year old g2p1 with 37 weeks of gestation with previous lscs which was done due to fetal distress has gone in active labor fetus is cephalic in presentation cervix is 7 cm dilated 80% effaced and head is at minus 3 station 7 cm dilated minus 3 station her pelvic examination shows diagonal conjugate as 10.5 cm interstitial diameter 10 cm intertuberous diameter 9 cm what is the next step in management option a cesarean section due to contracted pelvis option b cesarean section due to contracted mid pelvis option c cesarean section due to contracted outlet and option d vacuum delivery so what are you going to do here first tell me can you perform vacuum delivery in this patient yes or no so first first we will we will talk about things first tell me i'll i'll see your options also we are all of you are saying option c okay pehle to let me tell you many of you are wrong you know because many of you have said option c and that's wrong shivani was the first person to give me the correct answer right now tell me can you perform vacuum delivery in this patient no you cannot why because instrumental delivery whether it is vacuum or whether it is forceps in present day in modern day obstetrics it has to be done when head fetal head is at plus 2 station or below it right and because fetal head is at minus 3 station i cannot perform vacuum delivery number one reason is this right number two reason i'll come that why we cannot perform vacuum delivery is because this is a case of contracted pelvis and instrumental delivery is con is contraindicated in contracted pelvis now this we know that this is a case of contracted pelvis and so first is uh, you should know all the important diameters of the pelvis and when do you say that inlet is contracted mid pelvis is contracted or outlet is contracted now in inlet we have three ap diameters true conjugate obstetrical conjugate and diagonal conjugate the value of true conjugate is 11 cm and it is measured from the upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory then we have the obstetrical conjugate which is measured from middle of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory and it should be between 10 to 10.5 cm if obstetrical conjugate is less than 10 cm then you say that the inlet is contracted and diagonal conjugate is when you measure from lower border of pubic symphysis up till sacral promontory and diagonal conjugate should be 12 cm now what you have to understand is that if this is the pubic symphysis when i am doing a pelvic examination my finger is touching the lower border of pubic symphysis so amongst all the ap diameters of the inlet the one which can be measured clinically is diagonal conjugate right but when we are defining contracted pelvis we define in terms of obstetrical conjugate 
राइट right? तो हम मेजर कर सकते हैं डायगनल कॉन्जुगेट बट हम डिफाइन करते हैं इन टर्म्स ऑफ ऑब्स्टेट्रिकल कॉन्जुगेट विच मीन्स दैट इफ आई आस्क यू दैट डायगनल कॉन्जुगेट इज एक्स सेंटीमीटर्स राइट एंड हम मैंने मेजर किया आई कम टू नो कि डायगनल कॉन्जुगेट इज एक्स सेंटीमीटर्स नाउ इन ऑर्डर टू नो वेदर द इनलेट इज कॉन्ट्रैक्टेड और नॉट आई नीड टू नो द वैल्यू ऑफ ऑब्स्टेट्रिकल कॉन्जुगेट सो फ्रॉम एक्स आई विल हैव टू सब्सट्रैक्ट टू सेंटीमीटर्स वेन फ्रॉम एक्स आई सब्सट्रैक्ट टू सेंटीमीटर्स देन आई गेट द वैल्यू ऑफ ऑब्स्टेट्रिकल कॉन्जुगेट बिकॉज नॉर्मली डायगनल कॉन्जुगेट इज ट्वेल्व सेंटीमीटर्स and a vaginal delivery is possible only when obstetrical conjugate is 10 cm right if obstetrical conjugate is below 10 cm vaginal delivery is not possible and such a pelvis is called as contracted pelvis due to contracted inlet is this clear to all of you now in this question diagonal conjugate ki value di hai read your questions very very carefully i see so many of you in a hurry to answer that you don't read your questions properly yahan pe obstetrical conjugate ki value nahi di hai diagonal conjugates value has been given and diagonal conjugate they are saying is 10.5 so what will be the value of obstetrical conjugate minus 2 which is 8.5 so is the inlet normal or is inlet contracted it is a case of contracted inlet clear to all of you number 1 now let's look at the other diameters of the inlet the oblique diameter is 12 cm and transverse diameter is 13 cm now when we are talking about cavity or mid pelvis then the ap diameter is 11 cm and the transverse diameter is 10 cm and that is the distance between the ischial spines or interischial diameter now mid pelvis is said to be contracted if your interischial diameter is less than 8 cm normal value of interischial diameter is 10 cm and it is said to be contracted if it is less than 8 cm right similarly outlet the transverse diameter outlet is lying at the level of ischial tuberosities so outlet ka jo transverse diameter hota hai that is distance between the two ischial tuberosities and outlet is said to be contracted if intertuberous diameter is less than 8 cm normal value of intertuberous diameter is 11 cm so when we are defining contracted pelvis contracted inlet is defined in terms of obstetrical conjugate contracted mid pelvis is defined in terms of interischial diameter which if it is less than 8 cm then you say it's a contracted mid pelvis and contracted outlet is defined in terms of intertuberous diameter and again if intertuberous diameter is less than 8 cm less than equal to 8 cm then we say it is contracted outlet these are the theoretically defined contracted inlet inlet mid pelvis and outlet you also should know that on clinical pelvimetry clinically kaise pata lagta hai that it is a contracted inlet or contracted mid pelvis or contracted outlet so all the marrow subscribers i have shown to you clinically karke ki kaise pata lagta hai how it's a contracted inlet contracted mid pelvis or contracted outlet right so please go and revise that now over here diagonal conjugate is 10.5 so obstetrical conjugate will be 8.5 so it is contracted inlet interischial diameter is 10 cm so that means it is normal intertuberous diameter is 9 cm right but then intertuberous diameter if it is less than 8 then you say it's a contracted outlet right so over here this is a case of contracted inlet yes everyone clear to all of you any confusions here so in pelvis it is very very important for you to know this table the major diameters of the pelvis
If you've understood, just show me a thumbs up. I'll go to the next question. Great. Okay. Then question number five. Pain in early labor is limited to dermatomes. So in early labor, pain is limited to which dermatome? Option A, T10 to L1. Option B, S1 to S3. Option C, L4 to L5. And option D, L2, L3. Tell me quickly. A. So you are saying A. And this is a theoretical question and I expect all of you to give me correct answer for this. Quickly, let us see pain during labor. Please remember pain in early stages of labor or in latent phase is due to uterine contractions. And in uterine contraction, pain is mediated via hypogastric plexus and it is going to the dermatomes T10 to L1 because the uh, nerve supply of uterus is T10 to L1. Now, in the later stages of the first stage, that means in active phase, active phase pain is because of dilatation of the cervix and it is mediated via sacral plexus to S2 to S4. Now, in the second stage of labor, pain is due to stretching of, so over here you cannot read, I'm just writing over here, it is due to stretching of lower vagina and perineum. So, in the second stage of labor, it is due to stretching of lower vagina and perineum and via pudendal nerve, it is going to go to S2 to S4, right? So, in latent phase, pain is because of uterine contractions. In active phase, pain is due to dilatation of cervix and in second stage, pain is due to stretching of lower vagina and perineum. Now, whenever we say painless labor, for painless labor, we give epidural analgesia and whenever you are giving epidural analgesia, you are going to give it at the level of T1 because in early stages of labor, pain is initiated at the level of T1. So I'm going to give it at the level of T1, the block, and then all the lower segments are going to be blocked automatically. The drug of choice will be bupivacaine and the uh, you know, the strength which you are going to give is 0 0.0625 to 0.1%. Right now, whenever you are giving epidural analgesia, there will be a sensory block, there will be a sympathetic block, but there will never be a motor block. So, when you give epidural analgesia for painless labor, motor block is not seen, and that is why uterus keeps on contracting, and patient also can move as well. Right, so there is a sensory block, sympathetic block, but no motor block. The drug of choice, bupivacaine, and the strength also you should be knowing. Clear to all of you? Yes. Any confusion here? I don't think so. This is very theoretical. There won't be any confusion here. But please remember that whenever you are giving epidural analgesia, it uh, you know uh, extends the second stage of labor by one hour. So everything what is happening in second stage of labor, it gets extended by one hour. So epidural analgesia doesn't have any effect on first stage of labor. It will have an effect on second stage of labor and it extends the second stage of labor by one hour. Right? Coming to question number six, definitive sign of true labor. Option A, presence of show. Option B, spontaneous rupture of membranes. Option C, regular and progressive uterine contractions. And option D, head of the fetus enters the pelvic brim. Tell me, A, B, C or D? Which one? A, B, C or D? I can see many of you are answering it as option C. Right? And yes, all of you are correct. Bindu, it's not A. If I have to choose between A and C, it has to be C. Now, please understand. The difference between true labor and false labor pain. 
In true labor pain, you are going to get uterine contractions which will be regular and rhythmic in nature and they will be progressive. So there will be a progressive increase in intensity, progressive increase in frequency and the strength. Then true labor pains will always lead to dilatation of the cervix whereas in false labor pains there won't be any dilatation of the cervix and it will never be progressive. So these are the two things which are very very important when it comes to differentiating between true labor pains and false labor pains. Two characteristics which are the most important. Hoti hai. Number one, true labor pains they progressively increase in intensity, strength and duration. And number two, true labor pains lead to dilatation of the cervix, whereas false labor pains are never progressively increasing and they do not lead to dilatation of the cervix. Apart from this, or be differences, hote hai, for example, true labor pain ka pain is in lower abdomen and it radiates to back and to thigh. Whereas false labor pains, mein, there will never be radiating pain. You are going to pay, get pain which will be limited to lower abdomen. Patient will never say that the pain is radiating to back or to the thigh. Then uh, in true labor pains, you are going to get a blood mixed mucus discharge, which is called as show, which is not seen in false labor pains. Then in true labor pains, because the cervix is dilating, that is why when you will do a per vaginal examination, you can feel the fetal membranes, right? That is bag of membranes can be felt. Whereas in false labor pains, the cervix is not dilated, so bag of membranes will not be felt. In true labor pains, true labor pains are never relieved by rest or by enema, whereas false labor pains are mostly relieved by rest and enema. But the two very, very important characteristics of true labor pain are, number one, it's progressive increase, and number two, it leads to dilatation. Now, coming to your question, number one is, is spontaneous rupture of membranes a sign of true labor? No, because membranes can rupture even before the process of labor begins and that is what is called as premature rupture of membranes. Then, head of the fetus enters into pelvis brim. Is it a sign of true labor? No. When head of the fetus enters the pelvic brim, that is what is called as engagement. And engagement in a primary gravida female happens between 36 to 38 weeks. That means even before the process of labor begins. Right? Now I am left with option A and option C. Option A is also a sign of true labor and option C is also a sign of true labor. But as I told you just now, that the two very important signs of true labor are its progressive increase, right? So C answer is better than option A. Although A is also correct, but C is a better answer than option A. So the answer over here is going to be option C, that it is progressive in nature. Right? Clear to all of you? So that was question number six. Coming to question number seven. And your question number seven is, during first stage of labor, uterine contractions are marked on a partogram after every dash minutes. And while marking the contractions, they are measured for dash minutes. So on a partogram, I want to know that on a partogram, after how many minutes do you, mo do you uh, mark the uterine contractions? And when you are monitoring or when you are marking uterine contractions, for how much time are you going to feel the contractions? Okay, I've just got one answer just now. Anyone else? So your answers have started coming and I can see. Um, confusions between B, A, C. Again, this is a very, very basic question. See, kya hota hai? so many times what I've seen you people is that you people are so much, uh, you know, you are so over enthusiastic about your subjects ki you gain a lot of knowledge, advanced knowledge. Yahan tak ki ki so many times your uh, queries which I get on Marrowling group, they are so advanced. You people tend to remember all the rare things which are rarely asked. But wo questions, jo basic questions, hai, jo clinical applications, hai, which you should be knowing, you tend to overlook them. Right? Now, this is a very, very basic question on partogram. And if you have ever been to a labor room, you know that you have to do uterine contractions. Ko aap 
mark karoge on partogram and how are you going to mark uterine contractions on partogram that is also very important so look over here uterine contractions on see partogram may basically this is a part, partogram and the partogram which you have to refer to is a modified who partogram and this is a w modified who partogram just by looking at it i know this is a modified who partogram because modified who partogram may markings are going to begin only in active phase not in latent phase right so this over here the markings over here will begin from 4 cm dilatation and you are going to begin your marking from 4 cm dilatation right now partogram may there are three parts the upper part of partogram it tells you everything about the fetus so it is going to tell you the fetal heart rate status it is going to tell you about how much amniotic fluid is there uh, uh, it's not telling you how much amniotic fluid is there it tells you whether the amniotic fluid when the membranes are ruptured whether amniotic fluid which is coming out is clear or whether it is blood stained or whether it is meconium stained at what time did you do an arm all this is meant by liker right then comes molding so then you also write down what grade of molding is present so upper part of partogram is basically telling you out the fetal condition middle part of partogram is a cervicogram which is telling you basically about the progress of labor right so how much dilatation is happening with respect to time and the lower part of partogram is telling you about maternal conditions like how many contractions are happening how much oxytocin is being given what drugs are being given about blood pressure pulse temperature so bp pulse and temperature these are the three things which are noted from mother's vitals you never note the respiratory rate so if you get a question that on a partogram all of the following are monitored option a maternal heart rate option b uh, maternal pulse rate option b fetal heart rate option c maternal respiratory rate and option d mother's temperature so what is not monitored is mother's respiratory rate is not monitored right okay then you also see the urine output all these things are monitored in the bottom part of the partogram right now when we are talking about uterine contractions you can see over here that boxes are made so when how often am i going to monitor uterine contractions after every 30 minutes i'm going to note how many contractions are happening and i have to see that for 10 minutes how many contractions are happening right now if in 10 minutes two contractions are happening then each of this small box which you are finding over here contractions ke aage jitne bhi ye boxes hain so if two contractions are happening in 10 minutes i am going to color two boxes if three contractions are happening in 10 minutes i am going to color three boxes right so for after every 30 minutes i have to monitor uterine contractions and when you are monitoring uterine contractions you have to monitor them for 10 minutes now the way in which you are going to color the box is also very important if contraction is happening for less than 20 seconds then i am going to make dots in the box if contractions are lasting for 20 to 40 seconds then i am going to make oblique lines and if contractions are lasting for each contraction is lasting for more than 40 seconds then i am going to color the box in a solid manner right so the way in which you color the box and how many boxes you are coloring that tells you about how many contractions are happening and for how much duration they are happening is that clear to all of you so i want you to see this over here so in this graph what you can see over here three boxes are colored in the initial part that means when the patient came to us she was having three contractions in 10 minutes right and for how much time were these contractions lasting they were lasting for 20 to 40 seconds because oblique lines have been made right over here in this part of the partogram so as the labor was progressing now this female is having 
four contractions in 10 minutes right and these contractions are lasting for each contraction is lasting for more than 40 seconds right clear to all of you so this is how uterine contractions are marked on partogram and this is how you have to read them also or interpret them also clear to all of you so over here your answer will be option b 30 minutes and 10 minutes yes so you have to monitor after every 30 minutes and each time while you are monitoring, you are going to see it for 10 minutes. Clear to all of you? Okay. Come to this question, question number 8, which is also related to partogram. A very, very interesting question. So read question number 8, all of you. All of the following are true for partogram. Number one, time duration between action and alert line is four hours. Plotting should begin at three centimeters dilatation of the cervix. Third statement is each small square represents 60 minutes. Fourth statement is progress of the patient is normal in yellow zone. And fifth statement is dilatation of the cervix is represented by X. So tell me. Option A, 1, 2, 4 and 5 are correct. Option B, 2, 4 and 5 are correct. Option C, 1 and 4 are correct. Option D, 1 and 5 are correct. So some of you are saying 1 and 4 are correct. Some of you are saying 1 and 5 are correct. Many of you are saying option D is correct and I am so happy about it that you people know the basics of partogram. Okay, so at least ab aane galat, thode se galat aane shuru ho gaye. Okay, so just let me tell you the uh, little bit basics about partogram. Now, partogram may, as we saw over here, two lines are there, right? An alert line and an action line, right? So, alert line and action line ke beech mein jo time gap hota hai, that is four hours. Remember that, number one. Number two, in modified WHO partogram, the partogram which we are using these days, plotting begins from four centimeters dilatation right and plot you are going to plot only the active phase that is second point which you have to remember third point which you have to remember is that plotting jab start karni hai, either you are going to start on the action line or sorry on the alert line so the plotting has to begin either on the alert line or to the left of alert line so three things i have told you just now time duration between alert line and action line is four hours Plotting should begin only in active phase. That means when the cervix is 4 centimeters dilated. And plotting should begin on the alert line or to the left of alert line. Right? And these days, partogram may, we plot only cervical dilatation. We do not plot the, the descent of the fetal head. And whenever you are plotting dilatation of the cervix, you should use X mark, cross mark for dilatation, representing the dilatation of the cervix. So, dilatation of the cervix is represented by X, right? It is the descent of fetal head which is represented by a circle and these days we do not look at the descent of the fetal head. Now, as long as the progress of your patient is towards the left of alert line, Till that time, the progress of the patient is normal. The moment the progress of your patient touches the alert line or it comes to the right of alert line, right? That is something which means that now you have to get alerted. And the moment the progress of your patient touches action line or it comes to the right of action line, 
that means now you have to take the action and action is going to depend upon the diagnosis which you make right most of the times action is going to be cesarean section but not always depending upon the diagnosis i'm going to take an action right so when i am plotting a partogram i am going to plot from the active phase i am going to plot from when the cervix becomes 4 cm dilated either on the alert line or to the left of alert line and now the progress and i am going to mark it with x if the progress of my patient is towards the left of alert line i am happy that's normal progress the moment it touches the alert line or it comes to the right of alert line you should get alerted and if you have to refer your patient this is the time when referral should be done right and if it is touching the action line or if it is going towards the right of action line then it is going that means now some action needs to be taken right now this is modified who partogram now in order to simplify this there is a who simplified partogram in which various color are there now over here they haven't told you exactly where is the alert line and where is the action line but you can see over here that this line which we make will be corresponding to the alert line and 4 hours after that the line which we will make will be action line right now in this simplified who partogram there are three areas if the progress of your patient is falling in green area that means if it is towards the left of alert line that means it is normal progress if it is coming in this yellow or amber colored zone that means now you have to get alerted and if referral has to be done it has to be done now and if you are getting in red color zone that means now action should be taken right this is who's modif simplified partogram now another thing which you have to understand in a partogram is which i told you just now this x when you represent x that is what you have to look at that is cervical dilatation you don't have to look at these uh, circles which are made which are representing descent of fetal head you have to make an answer you have to interpret the partogram based on the lines which are drawn by joining the x because dilatation of the cervix is plotted by x right then if you see a partogram in a partogram you can see that there are small boxes and there are big boxes now the big square or the big box on a partogram is 1 r each whereas the small box is 30 minutes each right clear to all of you yes so now with this background read these statements again time duration between action line and alert line is 4 hours yes plotting should begin at 3 cm no it should begin at 4 cm each small square represents 30, 60 minutes no it represents 30 minutes progress of the patient is normal in yellow zone no it's not normal right it you should get alerted that me it is a now normal progress which is happening dilatation of the cervix is represented by x yes so 1 and 5 are correct that means option d is correct clear yes uh, a very nice way of remembering it uh they clinge you've said ki cervix x at the end and it is represented by x that that's a very nice way okay question number 9 which of the following is a part of active management of third stage of labor option a uterotonics after now this is format 1 we will talk about format 2 also just now which of the following is a part of active management of third stage of labor option a uterotonics after the delivery of the placenta option b controlled cord traction option c uterine massage and option d early cord clamping so tell me the answer to question number 9 format 1 first and this is your repeat neat pg question
So what is your answer here? Your answer is option B, right? So over here, it is controlled contraction. Why not? It is A because eutrotonics are not given after the delivery of placenta. They are given after the delivery of the fetus. Uterine massage earlier was a part. Now it is not a part, right? Controlled cord traction is modified brand and use technique and you have to deliver the uh, placenta by controlled cord traction. Early cord clamping is never a part of active management of third stage of labor. Dr. Sapna, uterine massage pehle part tha, ab nahi hai. Controlled cord traction to hamesha se part hai. Right? So, if I have to choose between B and C, your answer will be option B. Because earlier uterine massage was a part, now it is not a part. Right? So, although earlier uterine massage part tha, ab nahi hai, that is why I am choosing option B as the answer here. But now look at question 9 format 2. Which of the following is not a part of active management of third stage of labor? Option A, injection uterotonic. Option B, early cord camping. Option C, controlled cord traction. Option D, uterine massage. Now they are asking which is not a part of active management of third stage of labor. Option A, injection uterotonic. Option B, early cord clamping. Option C, controlled cord traction. Option D, uterine massage. Now what will your answer be? See, injection uterotonic is a part. Controlled cord traction is a part. Uterine massage earlier tha, ab nahi hai. Right? Early cord clamping is never a part of active management of third stage of labor. It is delayed cord clamping which is a part. So, here answer is going to be option B. Are you understanding this? So, you know, once, yes, this is an INI set question. Once you are clear with your options, you have to decide which one you are going to take. Never mug up your answer. Here we have not uterine massage. Ko nahi ka. We are saying uterine massage is, over here is not a part of active management of third stage of labor because controlled cord traction option. Mein tha. And here we are including uterine massage as a part of active management of third stage of labor. Right? So you will always have to write plus, minus, plus, minus and see which option are you going to choose. Is the, are these two formats clear to all of you? Uterine massage was earlier a part. It is now not a part. Right? But early cord clamping is never a part of active management of third stage of labor. Controlled cord traction is always a part of active management of third stage of labor. Injection uterotonic after the delivery of the fetus is always a part of active management of third stage of labor. Are you understanding? All those still who are saying option D, you are incorrect. Because here we have one such option that is never a part of active management of third stage of labor. So, I am telling you that in every place you will have to write like this, like I am writing. Eutrotonic. Yes, it is a part. Early cord clamping, no, it is never a part. Control cord traction, yes, it is a part. Uterine massage, earlier a part, now not a part. So clear cut answer ye nikal raha hai na, early cord clamping. Uterine massage ke aage to plus minus aa hai. Right? Okay. Now, this is one another very important question which I want to discuss with you. Look at the drug given in the image and mark the incorrect statement. So, this is what is given to you. You are given carboprost prostadin injection. And you have to mark incorrect statement. Option A, it is the most potent eutrotonic drug to prevent PPH. Option B, maximum dose which can be given is 2000 micrograms. Option C, it is contraindicated in asthma. And option D, it is never given intravenously. You have to tell me incorrect statement. Incorrect batana hai bacho. Itna confusion ki ho hai. Why are you telling me option D? Prostadin ko kabhi bhi intravenously dete dekha hai. 
तो यहाँ पे तो लिखा है ना इट इज इन नेवर गिवन इंट्रावीनियसली सो दिस इज अ करेक्ट स्टेटमेंट वाई आर यू मार्किंग इट एज ऑप्शन डी रीड द क्वेश्चन टेल मी विच इज इन करेक्ट स्टेटमेंट If you've been to labor room, you would have seen that prostatin is given IM. It is never given intravenously. So option D to hoi nahi sakta. All those who are saying D, think again. Prostatin injection is always given intramuscularly. It is not given IV. no one has given me correct answer till now to this question kaha hai marrow subscribers revise revise pph again and especially from the delta video revise pph if you are a marrow subscriber please go and look at the delta videos mcq discussion and whatever i have told you about these drugs please please revise it again you cannot afford to give me wrong answer in this question abhishek and saidyanath pragya pragya chalo pragya you are going to tell me why are you saying option a pragya you are saying option a is the answer why option a अभिषेक और प्रज्ञा में से एनी वन इफ यू आर लिस्निंग टू मी टेल मी वाई ऑप्शन ए यस एक्सलेंट आई डोंट नो हु दिस देख लेंगे इज बट नाउ यू अंडरस्टूड वाई इज द करेक्ट आंसर बिकॉज कार्बोप्रॉस्ट इज द मोस्ट पोर्टेंट यूट्रोटोनिक ड्रग टू ट्रीट पीपीएच Not to prevent PPH. Carboprost को हम use करते हैं in treatment of PPH. Prevention of PPH में now carboprost is not used. So active management of third stage of labor में you do not use carboprost. So many times पहले हम कहते थे कि carboprost use करते हैं in active management of third stage of labor. but now the guidelines are that carboprost has to be used only to treat pph and not to prevent pph and to prevent pph means active management of third stage of labor to kabhi bhi ab guidelines kya kehti hai ki you are not going to use pro carboprost to prevent pph you are going to use carboprost to treat pph right now the carboprost is dinoprost that is pgf 2 alpha it has to be given im you should never give it intravenously the dose of carboprost to treat pph is 250 micrograms and maximum you are going to give eight injections so 250 into 8 is 2000 micrograms right so option b bhi correct hai option c it is contraindicated in asthma is also correct and it is never given intravenously is also correct please remember this update that carboprost is not used in active management of third stage of labor to prevent pph it is the most potent eutrotonic drug to treat pph Ah, that is what happens. You people don't read most potent pada, and uske baad you said this is the correct statement, right? So this is question number ten. Question number eleven. Identify the lie of the fetus in the following image. Option A, longitudinal lie. Option B, oblique lie. Option C, transverse lie. Option D, unstable lie. A B C or D What is used for prevention jitni drugs active management of third stage of labor mein use karte ho oxytocin is used for prevention methergen is used for prevention sintometrin is used for prevention mesoprost is used for prevention right carbitocin is used for prevention 
so prevention clear you are using oxytocin that's the first line then you can use methyl ergometrin methergin sintometrin carbitocin which is synthetic oxytocin and you can use misoprost chal next question pe aayega if i was not able to follow so many of you are saying a then b c i don't know tum logo ko ye c kahan se dikh raha hai a aur b mein confusion ho i can understand how how can you say this is c is this transverse lie by any sense okay to chalo sabse pehle to let me clear your few concepts so uh whenever you are defining lie one way is to define lie in terms of uh, you know maternal spine and the axis of the fetus and the spine of the fetus but that's not a very good way why because pregnancy mein uterus is dextro rotated right so agar hum lie ko define karte hain in terms of relationship between the long axis of the mother and long axis of the fetus that is spine of the mother and spine of the uterus fetus then we tend to make mistakes because in pregnancy uterus is dextro rotated so whenever you have to comment upon the lie of the fetus first with your own hands you have to centralize the uterus so over here i am showing you an image where i am examining a patient right and patient ke lie pe comment karne se pehle i have centralized her uterus उसको डेक्स्ट्रो रोटेटेड से पहले मैंने उसको सेंट्रलाइज किया एंड नाउ आई एम गोइंग टू कमेंट अपॉन द लाई राइट सो ओवर हियर व्हाट यू शुड सी इज इज द यूट्रस सेंट्रलाइज बिफोर यू कमेंट अपॉन द लाई नो द यूट्रस इज नॉट सेंट्रलाइज यूट्रस इज डेक्स्ट्रो रोटेटेड तो पहले हम इमेजिन करेंगे कि आई एम गोइंग टू सेंट्रलाइज द यूट्रस नाउ द मोमेंट यू सेंट्रलाइज द यूट्रस ये जो अभी इस इमेज में विच इज अपियरिंग लाइक एन ओब्लीक लाई टू यू द मोमेंट यू सेंट्रलाइज द यूट्रस इट बिकम्स लॉन्गी ट्यूडनल राइट सो दिस इज नॉट ओब्लीक लाई दिस इज लॉन्गी ट्यूडनल लाई आर यू अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस प्लीज सेंट्रलाइज द यूट्रस एंड देन कमेंट अपॉन द लाई यस सो दिस इज अ केस ऑफ longitudinal lie so over here i have shown you this is also longitudinal lie because it is centralized uterus this is also longitudinal lie because over here you have to first centralize and then you have to comment upon the lie right over here this is centralized uterus and now this is oblique lie and this is again a centralized uterus with transverse lie are you getting it yes okay so these are all images from datta and in datta they have clearly shown it so don't forget i mean don't make this mistake one last question which i want you to want to discuss with you know there are two more questions that means this is the grip and then fetal position that is also one question which you people tend to make mistake so tell me identify the grip of this patient just the name you are i am not giving you any options you tell me what is the grip is it leopold's first second third or fourth maneuver chalo polic grip hai ki pelvic grip hai tell me this is this polic grip or pelvic grip this is polic and i'm no the moment i say i am so happy i start getting wrong answers also the moment i feel ki i don't have to discuss this question with you you people start giving me wrong answers this is polic grip polic grip or pelvic grip mein how are you going to identify only one or two things which you have to remember sabse pehle to in both these grips the bottom part of the uterus is being assessed right and that is why the confusion whether it is polygrip or whether it is pelvic grip right deep pelvic grip 
Now, in polyg grip, which is your Leupold's third maneuver, you will see examiner using one hand, right? So over here, we are seeing that one hand is being used and the examiner's face will be towards the face of the patient. Whereas, if it is deep pelvic grip, which is fourth maneuver, you will see both hands being used and the examiner's face will be towards the feet of the patient. Right? So, a hand use ho raha hai and pelvis wala area assess ho raha hai. That means it is polyg grip. Both the hands are being used and the pelvic area is being assessed. That means it is the deep pelvic grip or the fourth maneuver. Clear to all of you? Simply. Simple, very, very simple, whether it is polyg or pelvic, polyp may only one hand is used. In deep pelvic grip, both the hands are used. Polyg grip is third maneuver, pelvic grip is fourth maneuver. In polyg grip, the examiner is going to face towards the face of the patient. In pelvic grip, examiner is going to face towards the feet of the patient. Nothing else you have to remember here, right? This question I was talking about. I want you to answer this question for me. Then I'll show you the previous image also. But first this question. Identify the fetal presentation. Option A, B, C and D. ROP, ROA, LOP, LOA. Tell me. What position is this? All of you say it is, no, some of you say it's B. So many of you are saying it's B. ROA. Okay, so all of you are saying it's ROA. Okay. So how are you going to identify? You are going to look at the occiput. That where is the occiput facing? Whether occiput is facing anteriorly or whether it is facing posteriorly. Over here, the occiput is facing anteriorly, right? So, it is occipito. Anterior, it is towards the pubic symphysis. It is not towards the sacrum. So, it is occipito anterior, right? And it is towards your left-hand side because it is towards your left-hand side. And in labor patients, always we are going to you know, interchange. We are going to do the mirror image. So, if it is your left hand side, it will be mother's right hand side. Right? So, this is right occipito anterior position. Please remember always, jab bhi hum delivery perform karte hain, my face is towards the mother's face. Right? When I am performing delivery, I am facing towards the face of the mother. Right? So, mother's left hand corresponds to my right hand and mother's right hand corresponds to my left hand. So, if in this image, the head of the fetus is towards my left hand or towards your left hand, that means in the mother, it is going to be right hand. Right? So, this is right occipito anterior position. Is that clear to all of you? Yes. Similarly, this question over here. Identify the fetal position shown in the image. LOA, LOT, ROT, ROP. Tell me. What is this position? Uh, B, then, so you are confused between LOT and ROT. So, B and C. Is there confusion? Ho Please, bachcho, remember, no matter where, how they are showing you the image, no matter from which angle they show you the image, always and always you have to keep just two things in mind. 
one thing is that occiput you have to see the position of the occiput if occiput is towards pubic symphysis it is occipito anterior position if occiput is towards sacral promontory it is occipito posterior position and if occiput is midway it is occipito transverse position now sometimes instead of showing the occiput they can show you posterior fontanelle posterior fontanelle corresponds to the occiput's position and posterior fontanelle is a triangular fontanelle so instead of occiput they may show you a triangular fontanelle like this and then they may ask you the position so over here this triangular fontanelle is midway between pubic symphysis and sacral promontory so this is occiput to transverse position the second dictum which you always have to remember and which you get confused looking at ki ma'am is image mein pubic symphysis aage hai is image mein sacral promontory piche hai and dusri image mein ma'am sacral promontory aage thi and pubic symphysis piche thi nothing doing you simply have to remember that your left hand is mother's right and your right hand is mother's left irrespective of ki position kaise camera se photograph kaise li gayi hai irrespective of that you have to just remember like this right because whenever we are conducting delivery i am facing towards the face of the patient so do not get confused in this looking at the image you don't have to get confused and do not imagine ki ye image aise li gayi hogi ya ye image aise li gayi hogi that is a cameraman's work you have to answer in respect to if you were conducting delivery and when you are conducting delivery your face is towards mother's face so your left hand and mother's right hand are corresponding to each other is that clear to all of you so over here this is your right hand so if this is your right hand ye mother ka kya hoga left hand so this is left occipito transverse clear to all of you yes any confusions here any confusions no okay just put a thumbs up okay now now coming to this image see the image this is a condition which was seen in a multi gravida female when she came to labor after a dye tried to deliver her at home her cervix is 8 cm dilated vagina is hot and dry fetal head is at minus 3 station what is the next step in management so what are you seeing over here you are seeing that there is a very clear cut demarcation between the upper segment of the uterus and lower segment of the uterus a depression or a ring like depression is seen over here and this ring like depression which i am going to erase and show it to you again this this ring like depression which you are seeing over here this is what is bandel's ring right and bandel's ring means it is a case of obstructed labor and whenever you have a patient of obstructed labor always and always management is cesarean section you never give oxytocin you never apply instruments and you never give a rest because it can later lead to uterine rupture so never are you going to do these things always whenever you get a patient of bandel's ring management is emergency cesarean section bandel's ring is seen in obstructed labor and it is per abdominally seen plus felt whereas you have another ring which is called as shorders ring shorders ring is seen whenever you have used injudiciously when you have used oxytocin right and this is per vaginally felt 
it is not seen per vaginally and per abdominally you will not see or not feel it right bandel's ring can lead to uterine rupture whereas schroder's ring will not lead to uterine rupture bandel's ring is a retraction ring schroder's ring is a constriction ring bandel's ring is a pathological ring schroder's ring is a physiological ring ring right what labor for two days i am not getting labor for two days what are you asking me so clear to all of you yes now last question which i want to discuss indication for using the forceps shown in the image option a to deliver uh, the head uh, indication for using the forceps shown in the image i'll come to your question dekh lenge i am because uh, i am i was trying to figure out what you are saying wait first let me deal do this question question number 16 indication for using the forceps shown in the image option a to deliver the head in cephalic presentation of the fetus at plus 2 station in fully dilated cervix option b to deliver the head in cephalic presentation at the outlet in fully dilated cervix option c to rotate the head in deep transverse arrest and option d to deliver after coming head in breech tell me a b c or d a b c or d what is the indication for using this forceps two answers a and d chalo just let me tell you one thing forceps mein images mein number 1 wrigley's forceps image is important wrigley's forceps is a short stout forceps right chhota forceps hota hai stout hota hai and uh, outlet forceps hota hai right so yahan pe the forceps which you are seeing is a long forceps it's not a short forceps right so it cannot be an outlet forceps outlet forceps ka only example is wrigley's forceps right so it cannot be option b then it cannot be option c because forceps these days are not used to rotate the head right there was only one forceps which could rotate the head of the baby and that was a keeland forceps and keeland forceps these days is out of date it's outdated right ab is forceps mein ek typical cheez hai normally in all forceps you get only two curves ये जो अंदर का कर्व होता है दैट इज सिफेलिक कर्व एंड ये जो आउटर कर्व होता है इसको कहते हैं पेल्विक कर्व ये दिस इज वन फॉर्सिप्स वेर यू आर गेटिंग अ कर्व इन द हैंडल आल्सो, राइट सो इन द शाफ्ट आल्सो, नॉट इन द हैंडल इन द शाफ्ट आल्सो यू आर गेटिंग अ कर्व एंड दिस कर्व इज अ पेरेनियल कर्व एंड देर इज ओनली वन फॉर्सिप्स जिसकी शाफ्ट में यू आर गेटिंग अ कर्व and that is a perineal curve and this is piper's forceps right and so this image is a piper's forceps and piper's forceps is used to deliver the after coming head in breech so this is a piper's forceps very very important image forceps may image of wrigley's forceps is important keeland forceps is important and piper's forceps is important right piper's forceps is the only forceps jisme ye curve milega perineal curve clear to all of you yes any confusions so i hope you are not going to get this image wrong okay now i want all of you to go and watch on maro youtube sessions uh, the ini set questions uh, discussion which we have done the november 2021 ini set in november 2021 ini set there was a question which was related to management of second stage of labor right ki uh, who ne kya propose kiya hai for preventing perineal tears that is the new thing which i want you to go and uh, watch that session and specially go to that question in ini set 
November 2021, there were a couple of questions which were very, very important. So that session is very important even if you are appearing for your NEET PG exam. Please go and watch that session. There are two, three questions which are very important there, which I want all of you to make a note of, right? And one of them was uh, on the management, on how has WHO proposed to prevent perennial tears. The usual options were not there. That is why I want you to go and watch that session, right? Okay. So I hope I am clear today. All the questions were clear to you. I also have to make one announcement and that is, uh, you know, I am going to get very busy with the Maro edition six recordings now. And so I will not be taking up your sessions uh, every weekly as and when I am going to get time. I am going to uh, I am going to come and give you a few important points like these basic MCQs on gynae, but that doesn't mean that you interrupt your schedule. You please keep on revising. I have already given the schedule on Instagram that how you should be revising gynae, what topics should be taken up in which week. Please follow that and revise your gynae also. OBS you must have revised by now. Right? I am, that is what I am saying, uh, Abhishek, that weekly coming on time is little bit of problem for me because I am also going... Uh, for my classes also my some classes are also scheduled and i have my marrow edition 6 recordings as well right so i will not be available every week but i'll try to come as i mean as much as possible whenever and i have time i'll update you on my instagram handle also subscribe to this channel so that whenever i'm coming live you get a notification Uh, all the sessions pre, uh, Priyanka which I have taken till now they are there on my YouTube channel right uh, I will tell you how to go about with your internship and how you are going to prepare OBGY for next but give me some time just now I am a little busy I am occupied till the month of April after that I'll come back to you but yes in between I will keep on taking your sessions for gynae Uh, uh, on FB, I am not there always. On Instagram, I am always there, right? So if you can just subscribe to my Instagram handle, then you will get all the notifications which I have to give you. Not only this, so many times I have to give you important updates. That also I give on my Instagram account. Okay, take care, all of all of you, uh, ma'am. Any forceps used for option A? Ha, rather, jitne bhi hum forceps use karte hain. Uh, in your labor room, like Das forceps, Shirodkar forceps, all these forceps. So you don't have to worry about option A. Jitne bhi normally forceps use hote hain, all of them are used for indication A. For indication B, it is only Wrigley's forceps, right? And for indication C, it is Keeland forceps. For indication D, it is Piper's forceps right okay take care all the best keep preparing and keep practicing mcqs that's how you're going to learn just by revising your notes you are not going to learn keep practicing mcqs so that whatever you are learning you can apply that knowledge as well take care bye